If humanity needed to leave Earth, where would we go? Could our next home be some giant construction hanging out there in space? Something like the Stanford Taurus. This design was proposed by NASA in 1975. It's a space habitat that can house 10 to 140,000 permanent residents. It's supposed to be a completely self-sufficient colony. People living there will be able to produce their own food, have their own manufacturing, and build high quality and comfortable residences for the inhabitants. As you can see, the colony is basically a torus with a diameter of a bit more than one mile, and the habitat tube itself is around 1,410 feet across. Pretty much space to stretch your legs, I'd say. The ring is supposed to be connected to the hub with the help of a few spokes, which will be needed to transport people and materials traveling to and from the hub. This hub will be at the rotational axis of the station, which means it will experience the least artificial gravity. So it will be the easiest location for spaceships to dock. For the same reason, the zero gravity industry will be performed in a non-rotating module attached to the hub's axis. The torus will be used as living space since it is large enough to simulate a natural environment. It looks like a long, narrow, straight glacial valley with its ends curving upward and eventually meeting overhead to form a circle. The population density on the station will be similar to a densely populated suburb of a large city. Some parts of the torus will be dedicated to agriculture, others to housing. The torus will weigh almost 10 million tons. During the construction, they might use materials extracted from the moon and sent to space with the help of a mass accelerator. Only those materials that can't be obtained from the moon will be imported from Earth. Another source of materials might be asteroid mining. The torus will rotate at one revolution per minute. It's vital for creating artificial gravity. People and other living organisms can't withstand the absence of gravity for very long periods of time. But who knows, maybe with a space base as our new home, we could adapt to weightlessness. Anyway, there will be a stationary mirror positioned at 45 degrees. It'll redirect sunlight down to the colony. The inner disk of the torus will act both as a docking bay and a solar generation area. Approximately six miles away from the station, there will be a tethered power generation satellite providing additional power needed for the colony. There will also be a large, flat, stationary radiator sitting below the inner disk. It will help dissipate waste heat from the station. All the energy necessary for the functioning of the Stanford Taurus will come from solar power. People will use it for agriculture, illumination, and heating the station. Electricity generated from solar energy will also be used for everyday life, for example, for powering household appliances and for supporting interior lighting. The idea of Stanford Taurus was proposed during the 1975 NASA Summer Study, which was conducted at Stanford University. The main goal of this study was to explore and speculate on designs for future space colonization. Whether this project can be built in real life and whether it can actually be functional is still up for debate. But the analysis, based on modern solar technologies, claims that a large structure in space might indeed be supplied with electricity through solar power generators. Interestingly, Stanford Taurus refers only to one particular version of the design, and the concept of a ring-shaped rotating space station appeared at the beginning of the 20th century. A space settlement floating out there in the cosmos. It's not sci-fi. But, as always, there is a catch. Look at this tiny deserted asteroid. It may look lonely and barren, but if you peek inside, you'll see life blooming inside of it. These days, many people now live right inside these asteroids. It's not sci-fi. According to researchers, we might be able to create futuristic cities the size of Manhattan on gigantic space rocks. Of course, there's a catch. The asteroid we choose as our base has got to be at least a thousand feet wide. Though it's weird why life is inside this asteroid and not on its surface. You see, we can't really live right on asteroids. 
That's because we're not the little prince who indeed lived on an asteroid, according to the plot, but because there's too little gravity and too much radiation for us to handle if we chill outside. There are possible theoretical ways to stay on the surface, but it's going to be extravagant. So the only option is living inside asteroids. Nothing screams wildly theoretical like building an asteroid city. Living in space without any gravity isn't as romantic as it sounds. Researchers show that when people spend too much time in zero gravity, things start getting weird. Their eyeballs pop out, retinas detach, muscles shrink, and bones become as fragile as a potato chip. But imagine this – a space settlement floating out there in the cosmos. If you've watched enough sci-fi, you'd picture a massive structure spinning round and round. It spins to create gravity for all the lucky folks living inside. There's an actual prototype of this wizardry – the O'Neill Cylinder. This device is named after a physicist, Gerard O'Neill, who came up with the idea for NASA in the 70s. Now, there isn't a ton of data on this, but humans need roughly one-third of Earth's gravity to function properly. An O'Neill cylinder may not be able to generate massive amounts of gravity, but the genius behind it, Mr. O'Neill himself, designed them to spin around their long axis. This device creates a gravity-like force called centrifugal force. So if we ever get to use that, we'll be living happily on the inner surface of the cylinder, feeling pulled downward away from the center. But, as always, there is a catch. When the team crunched the numbers, they realized that the asteroids would break apart way before they could reach the speeds necessary to keep us grounded. And to make matters worse, most of these asteroids were more like loosely assembled piles of rock than a solid chunk. The small ones, like less than 6 miles across, are a mix of sand, pebbles, rocks, and boulders. They're all held together by the weak force of their own gravity. If you were to spin one of these asteroid buddies, all those parts would go flying off into space. Not cool. However, scientists didn't give up and they elaborated on the idea. They needed to find a way to keep the asteroids together. They played around with different ideas and they produced something crazy. Now, if you were to carry all your personal belongings every day right in your hands, at some point, the situation would be out of your control you'd have to collect all your stuff from the floor. But you're smart and you carry a bag, right? Well, it seems that if we want to control an asteroid, all we need is a ginormous bag. But not just any bag – a massive, flexible, and super lightweight mesh bag made from teeny tiny carbon nanofibers. These fibers are like tubes that are only a few atoms wide, but boy are they strong. So once we've got this cylinder-shaped bag all set up, we can start slowly spinning the asteroid using rocket motors deep within the rubble. And as it spins faster and faster, it'll start flinging all those pebbles, rocks, and boulders. And guess what? The carbon nanowire webbing is going to go flying out with them. This bag will be expanding and expanding until it reaches its absolute limit. And then the rubble inside slams into the now super tight webbing. It's like a crazy explosion of debris compacting together to create this massive hollow cylinder made entirely of concrete. Once all the dust settles, you can build entire towns, cities, parks, and even farmland on the inside of the cylinder. This is like something straight out of O'Neill's designs. You can even enclose the whole inner surface with a transparent roof. Outside of this incredible living area, you've got these thick concrete walls that are like superhero shields protecting against radiation. So not only do you have this space to live in, but you're also super safe from any harmful stuff outside. We still don't have this magic bag, as those magic carbon nanowires aren't mass-produced yet. But scientists claim that, according to the laws of physics, a tiny asteroid, like a few football fields put together, can be transformed into 22 square miles of living space. As of now, about 1.5 million people are living in Manhattan, and there are like tens of thousands of asteroids just hanging around in our solar system. You do the math. Seems like everyone will have a sweet spot to crash in space. Building a city in space is no easy feat. The main challenge still is to create a self-sustaining closed system that can keep going for the long haul. 
You see, cities on Earth rely on a much larger area to survive than just their own boundaries. But in space, the farther away from external resources a space city is, the more it needs to close its loops for oxygen, water, and food. Take the ISS, for example. It's about 40% efficient in recycling oxygen. But even then, its CO2 levels are always sky-high. NASA is on the case, though, trying to figure out how to magically turn that CO2 back into oxygen. Once we've tackled the basics, like protecting ourselves from radiation, dealing with pesky gravity, and finding some air to breathe, it's time to get creative in space. Enter 3D printing and rocket engines, the dynamic duo that will pave the way for space settlements. With 3D printing, we can kiss goodbye to relying on Earth for spare parts. We'll simply whip them up locally, cutting out the middleman. We can even use 3D printers to whip up a delicious pizza in a couple of minutes. Of course, we'll need some fresh ingredients, but your dinner might just be a push button away in space. To truly thrive out there, we'll need to tap into the riches of asteroids. These celestial treasures are bursting with raw materials, perfect for creating solar arrays, building materials for our colonies, and so much more. And let's not forget about comets. These icy wonders are like cosmic water fountains, providing us with precious H2O for drinking, bathing, and even shielding ourselves from radiation. Plus, we can use that water to produce hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel and fuel cells. So, let's say we pull this off. Can you imagine people living or born in space might end up being different from you and me? Like if humans can have babies up there, these space colonies might develop some cool cultures. They might even come up with their own languages, and get this, they could even evolve new physical traits. It's wild to think that just after 300 years, a colony of 2,000 people could look and act so differently from us. They might have different hair textures, skin types, and even be taller or more slender to deal with that low-gravity situation. We might even develop new organs to protect us from cosmic rays. Or we'll have gill-like structures to breathe carbon dioxide. Hey, I know, it sounds crazy. But these scientists are working on developing these carbon nanotubes as we speak. So maybe one day, we'll be living it up on our very own asteroid crib. It might seem like asteroid cities are just too far-fetched. But let's take a trip back in time for a moment. In 1900, no one had ever flown in an airplane. But today, thousands of people are zooming through the sky, comfortably seated in chairs, traveling at hundreds of miles an hour high above the ground, unaware that their luggage is on another plane going to a different destination. Ah well. You wake up with a start, feeling disoriented. You were dreaming of waterfalls and green fields just a moment ago. But now, your body is tingling weirdly. It feels as if you don't have enough oxygen to breathe, which makes you panic a bit. You open your eyes and look around. Oh, you're inside your sleeping capsule. Whew! Its walls are littered with different buttons and tiny screens. You press one of them, and one of the sliding panels sweeps to the side. You crawl out of your pod. The absence of your windows or any natural lighting makes you feel as if you're underground. Dozens of sleeping capsules line the walls. The door leading out of the dorm is made of metal. It looks heavy and unmovable. But once you press the button on the wall next to it, the door opens smoothly and soundlessly. After walking up a dimly lit corridor for a while, you find yourself in a smaller room. There's at least half a dozen bulky spacesuits inside. There's another door in the room. It looks even sturdier than the previous one. If you wanted to open it, it wouldn't budge. First, you need to put on one of the spacesuits. As soon as it's on, the door automatically unlocks. After waiting for a while in an airlock chamber, you finally make a step outside. You look up and see a beautiful blue orb. It seems to be glowing. It's Earth, and you're standing near your home base on the moon. You walk towards your Jeep. It looks nothing like cars on Earth, though. The vehicle you climb into is pressurized, and you can even take off your spacesuit, or at least your helmet, and ride in comfort. If you need to go outside, well, yes, you can't do it without wearing your protective gear. 
One of your favorite rovers, produced by Toyota, is the size of two microbuses and can easily fit two passengers and their gear. Of course, you've got the experience of riding it with three other companions, but duh, you were squashed like sardines that time. The vehicle can also unfurl solar panels to generate power. After dealing with all the tasks you had on your list, you come back to your lunar home. Unlike your house on Earth, it looks more like a castle. Due to the extreme temperatures on the moon, the lack of oxygen, the constant threat of meteorites, and the never-ending barrage of radiation from the sun, it has to be super sturdy. The thing is, on Earth, we're protected by the atmosphere. Most meteorites burn while passing through it, and it also protects Earthlings from harmful ultraviolet radiation and creates the pressure without which liquid water couldn't exist on the surface of the planet. On the moon, there's no atmosphere like that. The very weak one that exists on our natural satellite is made up of some unusual gases that haven't been found in the atmospheres of Earth, Mars, or Venus. That's why people living on the moon have to take care of these issues themselves. The first towns on the moon were built in craters and covered with protective materials, like plastic reinforced with a net made of titanium and UV-resistant superfiber. The inhabitants had to access their homes through airlock entrances dug into a mound. Bilbo Baggins would surely appreciate their aesthetics. On the moon, gravity is way weaker than on our home planet. And while it makes it easier for you to walk and even run on the satellite surface, even despite your bulky spacesuit, it's not great in the long run. That's why inside lunar bases, there's an artificial gravitational field. Without it, people would have problems with coordination, balance, and orientation in space. Plus, weight-bearing bones would lose 1% to 1.5% of mineral density per month. <laughs> and there would be many other problems with health. <coughs> anyway, these days, along with old settlements located in craters, there are new towns that look like transparent glass spheres. They make a beautiful picture when you look at them while approaching the moon after visiting your family on Earth. Next to many of these domes, you can spot tall sun-reflecting towers. They can simulate the day cycle to help human bodies function properly as they used to be on our home planet. Inside, there's a breathable atmosphere and fixed atmospheric pressure. The floors look as if they're made from regular concrete, but the material used in the construction is lunar dust. A colony on Mars would cost us trillions of dollars to construct and inhabit. It would take a long time for even one cargo ship to reach the red planet. But Lunar towns are much easier to build and maintain. There are direct spaceship routes connecting the satellite with Earth. And you need just three days to travel between these two points. That's one of the reasons the colonies on the moon are growing, developing, and changing non-stop. When people first came to the moon with the intention of building settlements, their main concerns were producing energy and getting oxygen and water for a comfortable life. Now, you have trash can-sized nuclear reactors that provide the towns on the moon's surface with steady power. Plus, in some regions of the satellite, for example near the South Pole, there is near-constant sunlight, which is great for getting solar power. That's one of the reasons why most lunar settlements are built in that area. Another thing that makes colonizing the moon easier is its ice. People living on the satellite use it to make hydrogen-oxygen rocket propellant. The main way to get the raw material is by using the regolith and ice drill for the exploration of new terrains. That's a piece of equipment designed for drilling in ice-cemented regolith and rock. This fuel is then used for cargo and passenger ships coursing between Earth and the Moon. Right now, People are trying to derive oxygen and other useful products from lunar soil. More than 40% of the lunar crust is composed of oxygen. Of course, it's bound up in minerals in combination with other elements. These compounds are called oxides. You might have heard of quartz, aka silicon dioxide. It's the second most common mineral in Earth's crust. 
To move from one lunar town to another, you use moon Ubers, taxing people and cargo. They're also called all-terrain hex-limbed extraterrestrial explorers or athletes. They have six limbs that can grip cargo and roll or step over obstacles. Plus, they can switch out quick connect gripping and digging tools if you need them. They also carry people to and from launch pads, acting as lunar airport shuttles. But lunar towns aren't just placed where people live. They're innovative research hubs both for industry and science. They're also a popular tourist destination. Plus, people living there are tirelessly working on developing and constructing a special base for future Mars missions and the exploration of distant space. But let's have a look at how it all started. For instance, how the first lunar bases were built. Private landers descended on the surface of the moon and deployed inflatable modules, each around four stories tall. They served as residential areas, workspaces, industrial sites, and scientific labs. But those modules couldn't completely protect their inhabitants from harmful radiation, temperature swings, and the strikes of micrometeorites. So, people developed robots that could 3D print protective shells around each inflatable module. They used readily available regolith taken from the surface of the moon. It took the robots about three Earth months to finish solid domes. Some of these settlements were later connected with one another through a series of walkways linked to airlocks in each dome. At the same time, some of the towns remained separated, like those constructed in craters. When you visit Earth, you often look up at the sky, searching for your new home. Some of the lunar bases are visible if you're looking at them through a telescope. Others, partially hidden underground or covered with lunar rocks and soil for better protection, are almost impossible to spot. All right, let's imagine that humans have evolved to survive on very little oxygen. That means the Earth is now a no-go zone for us. And let's say that now we can live only on planets with little to no oxygen. It's time to build new homes on Mercury and Jupiter. So let's explore what life would be like if that happened. As you set foot on Mercury, you'll immediately notice how crazily bright it is. Mercury, being the closest planet to the sun, is a never-ending summer vacation. Right now, it's scorching hot at a sizzling 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But since we don't need any water or oxygen, our bodies have adapted to the blazing heat and dry conditions of Mercury. Instead of overheating, our skin possesses a special protective layer that helps us handle these conditions. So, we're able to live there without any discomfort. How cool is that? On Mercury, the air is very thin. As a result, the sky there appears mostly dark and empty. The surface, however, is pretty colorful. It can appear orange and golden due to the planet's rocky terrain and the intense sunlight. All this creates some captivating views. Our activities would be super exciting. The gravity on Mercury is very weak almost three times weaker than Earth's. So, imagine gliding through the air with incredible wingsuits, effortlessly soaring above the molten landscapes. So many possible cool tricks to show off. The buildings in this world are both imaginative and practical. They're made of special materials that can handle the heat and shine with a metallic gold color, reflecting the scorching sunlight. As you can see, our life in this small, hot world can still be pretty exciting. But let's move on to Venus. Now we've got ourselves quite a workload. This is the wildest and wackiest planet in the neighborhood. Temperatures there sizzle at a mind-boggling 900 degrees Fahrenheit. But guess what? Our bodies are cool with it. We can handle extreme temperatures. The winds there are crazy fast, reaching speeds of 224 miles per hour. Amongst them, we spot mysterious dark streaks that refuse to budge. Even scientists are puzzled by these streaks, which soak up ultraviolet radiation. It's like Venus has some secret party tricks up its sleeve. And speaking of parties, the planet is packed with active volcanoes, and they're always putting on quite a show. Molten lava flows and fiery eruptions are our daily dose of entertainment. Venus is similar in size to Earth, so the landscape feels familiar, but with a twist. It has a crazy amount of pressure that would make even the toughest creatures on Earth squirm. But not us. Our bodies are built to handle it, and we confidently strut around Venus like it's no big deal. Our cities shine like beacons, built with materials that can handle the intense heat and pressure. 
The metallic structures reflect the fiery glow of the Venusian sun. Inside, we've got super advanced cooling systems that keep us comfy despite the scorching temperatures. We surf on streams of molten lava, safely of course, and explore the volcanic landscapes. Pretty exciting, isn't it? But still, how about moving to a more friendly environment? Like Mars. Moving to Mars is one of our biggest goals. Its surface is a colorful canvas with hues of brown, gold, and tan. It's covered in rusting iron, regolith, which is like Martian soil, and dust. We would also be surrounded by volcanoes, impact craters, crustal movement, and mighty dust storms. As we gaze into the sky, we are greeted by Phobos and Deimos, Mars's moons. The sky itself is hazy and painted in shades of red, and becomes blue during the sunset, opposite to what we have on Earth. The temperatures on Mars can be quite extreme. Sometimes it's as mild as a comfortable 70 degrees Fahrenheit, while at other times it plunges to bone-chilling lows of around negative 225 degrees Fahrenheit. But once again, let's assume that our bodies have adapted to handle these swings. We've also developed ways to safeguard ourselves from meteorites and asteroids. These guys will be our frequent guests. The thin atmosphere of Mars doesn't provide much protection from them. Out of all the planets, Mars would be the easiest one for us to adapt to. Our next candidates, though, are not that hospitable. Living on Jupiter, the gas giant is a whole new level of adventure. Since there's no solid ground to walk on, we've come up with some super cool ways to call this place home. Picture floating cities like gigantic bubbles, suspended in swirling gases and liquids. They're specially designed to withstand extreme pressures and temperatures. To get around, we have jetpacks and hovercrafts. Imagine floating amidst Jupiter's majestic atmosphere, surrounded by cold, windy clouds of ammonia and water. These vibrant stripes and swirls paint the planet with a colorful palette. We zip through the colorful clouds, enjoying a mesmerizing kaleidoscope. Our homes and cities are filled with vibrant colors and shimmering lights. We've even created artificial gravity zones, where we can experience a semblance of gravity and walk with a bounce in our step. But be careful. Jupiter's powerful storms can be intense. Luckily, we have advanced weather prediction technology that keeps us safe. We watch the mesmerizing light shows of lightning dancing across the sky, marveling at the raw power of nature. All this sounds pretty fun, doesn't it? Well, what about the next gas giant, Saturn? Once again, we can live in the skies of Saturn, right among its beautiful rings. Our cities are like big colorful balloons that sparkle and shine with bright lights. Inside, we have large domes where we can freely enjoy everything this incredible planet has to offer. Instead of walking, we use special devices that make us glide through the air, just like on Jupiter. In this extraordinary place, we had to discover new ways to generate power. We use the energy from Saturn's powerful storms. These sources of energy help us fuel our floating cities, giving us the electricity and resources we need to thrive. Saturn has many moons, and each one has its own special features. We've set up outposts on some of these moons, where we can go on exciting adventures and explore their mysterious landscapes. But if living on a gas giant wasn't challenging enough, we also have ice giants in our system. Welcome to the fascinating world of Uranus. Despite the super chilly temperature of negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit, we've come up with clever ways to make this place livable. To create warmth, we can learn from Earth's greenhouse effect. Like a cozy blanket, we can introduce special gases into Uranus's atmosphere that trap heat. Another idea is to build gigantic mirrors to capture and reflect the sun's heat. But let's be honest, it would be quite a challenge to position all those massive mirrors just right. Our homes are designed to withstand extreme conditions. We use dense fluids like methane, ammonia, and water to build structures that keep us warm and cozy. Our habitats provide shelter from the freezing temperatures outside. We may even discover new forms of life that have adapted to the unique conditions of this icy giant. Now that would be chilling for sure. And finally, we have Neptune. It is the cool and distant cousin of the solar system. Neptune's atmosphere is mostly composed of hydrogen, helium, and methane. There's also no water, only lots and lots of ice. But that's fine with us, right? So it's time to construct habitats. Let's envision another sky city. After all, who doesn't love the idea of floating cities amidst the clouds? Imagine gazing out from your sky city, observing the mesmerizing hues and swirling storms of this ice giant. 
the vibrant colors of the atmosphere would paint a breathtaking backdrop for our daily adventures. We'd explore the mysteries of Neptune's moons, delving into their icy landscapes and uncovering the secrets they hold. Hey, a world where humans don't need oxygen or water to survive doesn't sound that bad. We'd soar through the skies and roam vast landscapes. The only limits we would have would be the limits of our own imagination. So stay tuned for more captivating what-if scenarios. People haven't set foot on the moon in several decades, but the situation is going to change soon. NASA's Artemis program is going to send a few missions to Earth's natural satellite. The first astronauts might step on the surface of the moon already in 2025, as part of Artemis 3, if the current schedule holds, that is. And then the next stage will start, and it will be an even more ambitious project than sending humans to the moon again. NASA wants to construct a base camp at our satellite's south pole. Such an outpost will help the Artemis mission to break the previous record for the longest stay on the moon. So far, it's 74 hours, 59 minutes, and 38 seconds. Plus, such a camp can serve as a jumping-off point for missions setting off for deep space. According to NASA, at first, it's going to be a small camp, accommodating missions for a week or two. But soon, it'll grow in size and complexity and will be able to sustain crews for a couple of months at a time. There might also be an open-top rover similar to the one used in the Apollo missions and an RV. These options can provide mobility for astronauts while they live and work at the camp. With each new trip, the level of comfort of space explorers will increase. Specialists are now developing the technologies that will help people to work more easily on the moon, far away from home. There's also hope that building such a camp can help us prepare for an even more challenging step, human exploration of Mars. For the camp to function properly, it's very important to be able to find and extract resources from the satellite's rocks and dust. These resources can include water ice, metals, oxygen, and even some building materials. It'll help to lighten the load with supplies delivered to the moon. It can also potentially allow astronauts to remain there for longer periods of time. Now, why the lunar south pole? There are two very important reasons. First, Building the base camp there will allow astronauts to have periods of continuous light from the sun. The moon is tilted in such a way that its south pole experiences up to two months of continuous light every year, when the sun is circling above the horizon all the time. And all this abundant sunlight can provide the camp with a lot of solar power. At the moment, NASA is trying to design a solar array that could stay more than 30 feet in the air. This way, it'll be able to make the most of the available sunlight. The second reason for choosing this location is deep craters that have been shrouded in darkness for billions of years, also because of the moon's peculiar tilt. Some of these craters haven't seen sunlight since the time of their formation. They're also known as permanently shadowed regions. And that's where scientists have found evidence of water ice. If we manage to access this frozen water and it turns out there's a lot of it there, it'll be hugely valuable for the inhabitants of the base camp. Plus, it might supply flights back to Earth or further on to Mars. We don't know yet whether there's a lot of water in that region or whether it's free of contaminants, but NASA is going to find out. One of the ways to do it is to use Viper. This mobile robot is likely to arrive at the lunar south pole in 2024. The Lunar Terrain Vehicle or LTV for short, is scheduled to arrive on a mission in 2025. Astronauts will be able to operate it remotely, and it's likely to be able to avoid such hazards as rocks and craters on its own. Astronauts will then explore their surroundings either from the safety of the lander on earlier missions or, later on, from the base camp itself. Plus, NASA will use the LTV to conduct scientific or mission-related work even during periods of time when there will be no humans on the moon. The vehicle will play a crucial role in searching for water, ice, and other resources. But even though the LTV's remote-controlled capabilities are quite innovative, its design isn't going to change much. It'll look almost like the rovers that have come before it. If astronauts decide to drive the vehicle with its top open, 
they will have to put on their spacesuits, and that's not very comfortable. Donning such a suit can easily take hours. Plus, the duration of missions always depends on how much oxygen each astronaut's spacesuit has left. That's where NASA's RV-like concept, known as the Habitable Mobility Platform, comes into play. If this project succeeds, the RV will have a pressurized interior and life support systems, meaning passengers will be able to have a ride without their spacesuits on. This will definitely make life easier for astronauts. The final design of the vehicle isn't ready yet, but the main goal is to allow several people to live and work inside the vehicle for up to two weeks. Now let's have a look at what the future lunar cabin might look like. Its design hasn't been finalized either, but NASA is looking at modular and inflatable structures. It may help to create larger spaces for crews to live in. Plus, such kinds of structures are more compact and lightweight, so it will be easier to transport them to the moon. But there's one more intriguing possibility. How about a large-scale 3D printer that will use lunar soil and rock as its raw material? Such a machine might be able to produce bricks and other shapes, assembling dwellings from scratch. A prototype 3D printer is now building a test structure in Houston. Also, the first towns on the moon could probably be built in craters. They might be covered with protective materials, like plastic, reinforced with a net made of titanium and UV-resistant superfiber. The inhabitants would have to access their homes through airlock entrances dug into a mound. Bilbo Baggins would surely appreciate their aesthetics. On the moon, gravity is way weaker than on our home planet. And while it can make it easier for astronauts to walk and even run on the moon's surface, it's not so great in the long run. That's why inside the lunar base, there might be an artificial gravitational field. Without it, people would have problems with coordination, balance, and orientation in space. Plus, weight-bearing bones would lose 1 to 5% of mineral density per month. A geologist from the University of Notre Dame, who's been studying samples of lunar soil, says that rocks or dust may have a key role in protecting astronauts from radiation coming from solar flares and cosmic rays. On Earth, the planet's atmosphere and its magnetic field filter out most of this harmful radiation. But the Moon doesn't have the same shield because there's no atmosphere like on our planet there. The very weak one that our natural satellite has is made up of some unusual gases that haven't been found in the atmosphere of Earth, Mars, or Venus. That's why people working there will need extra protection. The experts say that up to six feet of lunar material might be needed to shield astronauts from the radiation. But besides building materials and water, there's another crucial resource on the moon, and it's oxygen. NASA hopes to start extracting this gas from moon rocks. They also hope to find metals like aluminum. This could allow astronauts to live off the land, and the base would become much more self-sufficient than expected. It could turn into a resupply station for spaceships heading for Mars. But a colony on Mars would cost us trillions of dollars to construct and inhabit. It would take a long time for even one cargo ship to reach the red planet. Lunar camps are much easier to build and maintain. There will likely be direct spaceship routes connecting the satellite with Earth. And people will need just three days to travel between these two points. That's one of the reasons the colonies on the moon will be growing, developing, and changing non-stop. Let's talk about cyberpunk a really cool genre of science fiction that started in the early 1980s. Its pioneer writers were really interested in how technology was changing society, especially with all the digital evolution happening at that time. One of the writers, Bruce Sterling, wrote an introduction to a book called Mirror Shades, which was like a guide to cyberpunk. He said that this genre is all about looking at technology in a new way, not just for science fiction writers, but for regular people too. It's like imagining a world where high-tech stuff and the cool underground culture mix together. The heroes of cyberpunk stories are mostly rebellious people who stand up against big companies and the boring mainstream. They believe in being unique and doing their own thing, even when the world tries to contain their efforts. These heroes are really good at taking things from popular culture and using them to express their own ideas and interests. They also know how to use computers to find out secret information, 
and spread messages that go against the system. These days, cyberpunk themes are seen in more than just literature. You can find their influence in things like movies, video games, and even fashion. It does make you wonder, though, could the future truly turn out to be what cyberpunk writers predicted? Truth is, all the cyberpunk literature is packed with mind-blowing technology that might just become a reality one day. Like augmented reality, for instance. Now, this might sound far-fetched, but we're actually getting closer to experience AR in our daily lives. I mean, some companies are already offering such devices. Right now, they're mostly used for gaming and entertainment. But soon enough, we might use them for virtual training, education, and even shopping for a new car or checking out a house. Next up, smart clothes. In cyberpunk video games, people are rocking these stylish garments that not only look cool, but also offer some serious protection. We're not quite there yet, but smart clothes are becoming a thing in our world too. You've probably heard of smartwatches and fitness trackers, right? Well, imagine clothing that can monitor your body's movements, suggest healthy habits, and adjust your body temperature. Some fashion brands are already exploring this exciting field. Now let's dive into virtual reality. In one particular cyberpunk story, there's a feature where you can customize your own virtual reality experience. It's like stepping into someone else's shoes and reliving their memories. Now, VR is already pretty amazing in our world. We use it for medical purposes, gaming, and tourism. And here's something even cooler. Imagine being able to feel things in virtual reality. Yeah, it's called haptic technology, and it's being developed to make VR even more immersive. You could use it to control machines, learn in a virtual classroom, or even attend a concert with friends who are miles away. Last but not least, we have artificial intelligence. In a cyberpunk scenario, AI is everywhere, from brain analysis to taxis with intelligent controllers. Now, we might not have all that advanced AI just yet, but we're definitely making progress. You're probably familiar with all those virtual assistants featured on smartphones. Well, imagine them getting even smarter. AI is expected to be integrated into so many aspects of our lives, like fridges that can automatically order groceries when we're running low, self-driving cars, and delivery drones. And hey, AI is already helping companies suggest personalized content based on certain preferences. In the future, it might even help us find the perfect recipe for dinner or recommend the ideal cosmetic product just for us. Then, there's the potential for a brain-computer interface, or BCI for short. In a cyberpunk world, it's like a special connection between our brains and the internet that would allow people to virtually explore using just their minds. In the real world, scientists are already working on developing BCI systems. They can read the signals from our brains and turn them into commands. So instead of using a keyboard or a mouse, we might be able to control objects just by thinking. Right now, these BCI devices are being used in research settings, but someday they could be used to support people. They could help with regaining useful functions and improve rehabilitation. It doesn't stop there, though. BCI could also help professionals like pilots and surgeons. It could make their natural skills even better and help them do their jobs with even more precision. But, you know, there are also some things we need to be careful about when it comes to this cyberpunk technology. In the cyberpunk world, there are serious problems to consider. One of the concerns, for instance, is that if we rely too much on technology, it might start making decisions for us. We might become less skilled at day-to-day -day tasks because we let the machines do everything for us. That's why we should focus on using our own resources to make our own choices. Another thing we need to watch out for is protecting our information. All sorts of security breaches are already happening all over the world. We need to make sure we have strong measures in place to keep our information safe. Science and technology are moving at an incredible pace these days. It's hard to pinpoint what the future might look like, 
but you surely have some sort of scenario in mind. Maybe you envision a world where robots and AIs, controlled by a handful of powerful corporations or individuals, dominate the scene with unjust power structures. Or perhaps you picture sprawling cities filled with skyscrapers and flying cars shrouded in perpetual darkness. And maybe the future seems bleak, where only a privileged few have access to nature, while the rest struggle to make ends meet on a harsh planet. In the cyberpunk world, our planet is either on the brink of a disaster or has already fallen into complete ruin. The stories consistently revolve around dominance and control, whether it's between the rich and the poor, corporations and the market, or humans and the AI robots they create. Cyberpunk is all about systematic and oppressive inequality. It's also about a future where most humans live in a highly mechanized society that disconnects them from the rest of the natural world. In this potential future, all the amazing technologies we've created don't really improve the lives of most people. In fact, they make things worse. It's not all bad, though. Sci-fi can be more than just entertainment. It has a way of inspiring and shaping our real world. Throughout history, designers have drawn inspiration from sci-fi for inventions for things like flip phones, self-driving cars, and even the concept of the metaverse. There are also many interesting alternatives for the future. Ever heard of solar punk? It's also a genre of speculative fiction, but one that envisions technology and the environment evolving together. The solar part is all about the power of solar energy while the punk part puts it in the same awesome group as other sci-fi genres like cyberpunk. So what does solar punk actually look like? Well, imagine visually stunning utopias that are all about the environment and being positive. In solar punk worlds, they've totally sorted out how to correctly use the planet's resources or are actively working together to fix it. It's all about coming together and being friends in the fight against a bleak future. When you enter a solar punk universe, you'll be greeted by groovy green tech, cities that are super walkable, and tons of lush greenery. It's all about living in harmony with nature, while still rocking the latest technology. It's like the complete opposite of cyberpunk, which is all about grimy cities, greedy corporations, and fear of outsiders. Solar punk is all about putting people first and recognizing the amazing connection between human intelligence and the Earth. One of the major influences on solar punk is Art Nouveau. This art movement is all about embracing organic and earthly shapes, and it fits perfectly with solar punk's vibe. Another cool reference for solar punk is the arts and crafts movement from the late 19th century. It was all about rebelling against unnecessary waste. Have you ever wondered how cool buildings of the future are going to look? Well, hold on tight because artificial intelligence is here to revolutionize the world of architecture. AI is a great sidekick. It can give the architects incredible new tools to create mind-blowing structures that are not only stunning, but also eco-friendly and super efficient. So let's check what our beautiful future might look like. First of all, you know how cities can get crazy busy and overwhelming, right? Well, guess what? AI is here to save the day and make our cities super smart. Imagine you're cruising down the road in your flying car. Yes, we'll have those. Thanks to AI, the traffic flows like a dream. No more endless gridlock. The city knows where the most likely crime spots are and takes proactive steps to keep us safe. It's like having superheroes on every corner. And hey, forget about trash piling up. AI makes sure waste is managed efficiently, keeping our city clean and fresh. They can act as a city manager who can optimize everything from traffic to safety and even waste disposal. They can analyze tons of data from all sorts of places like sensors and social media. With all that information, they can help city planners make brilliant decisions that make our lives better. Okay, so you stroll down the street and your eyes are instantly captivated by an extraordinary building. Its futuristic curves and features make it stand out from the rest. And it not only catches your eye, but also gives Mother Nature a high five. You might think it was designed by a genius architect, but little do you know it was actually a collaboration between humans and artificial intelligence. Imagine having a super smart design buddy who can whip up thousands of incredible building ideas in a blink of an eye.
That's what AI-assisted design software does for architects. It can generate and assess a ton of design options. They take into account stuff like the best materials to use and the perfect placement for the building. Also, by analyzing data and crunching numbers, algorithms can help optimize the building's design. They can ensure it minimizes energy usage, conserves water, and manages waste like a pro. Every building strives to reduce costs, save energy, and promote a better world. The result? Architectural masterpieces that are both jaw-droppingly beautiful and super practical. The cityscape of the future will be dotted with these awe-inspiring structures. Oh, but that wasn't impressive enough for you? Well, how about a stunning, futuristic building that seems to defy gravity? It's not made of traditional bricks and mortar, oh no! This marvel was created using the powers of 3D printing. With the help of AI, architects designed every intricate detail and fed all the important data, like what materials to use and how the site conditions might affect the structure. AI algorithms worked their magic to optimize the design, making it both breathtakingly beautiful and rock solid. 3D printing is basically like having a magical machine that can create awesome structures straight out of a sci-fi movie, and AI jumps in to make sure these structures are not just pretty, but also strong. In the city of the future, 3D printing will become the ultimate architect's tool. It will allow them to create structures that were once impossible to build. From mind-bending shapes to intricate details, the possibilities are endless. But AI isn't just making buildings look great, it also makes them efficient and cozy. Let's say you step into a futuristic office building, and voila! The lights automatically adjust to match your mood, and the temperature is set perfectly for you. These futuristic buildings are capable of sensing and responding to their surroundings, just like you do. They control the lighting, keeping it just right for the time of day. They manage the temperature, so it's always cozy and comfortable. They even keep a watchful eye on security and fix small issues before they become big headaches. So, the smart building knows when people come and go, so it optimizes energy usage accordingly, saving the planet and some cash along the way. Now the cool thing is, all these aren't the only possibilities. How about turning skyscrapers into a vertical forest? Recently, an architect from India got super excited about the power of artificial intelligence. So, he decided to team up with an image bot called Midjourney to create a vision for the future. But instead of a dull, robotic world, they aimed for something spectacular. With text prompts like utopian technology and futuristic towers, the architect and AI got to work. Guess what? Mid-Journey didn't disappoint. It conjured up a world where buildings were covered in lush vertical forests and adorned with shapes inspired by nature. They wanted to create a sustainable future that harmonized with the environment. The architect, Manas Bhatia, is super positive about AI's potential. He doesn't see it as a threat to his job, but as a powerful tool for positive change. He envisions a future where architects and AI collaborate to make breathtaking designs. In his project, Patia even asked the AI to imagine symbiotic and hollowed structures, and it responded with pictures of apartments nestled within hollowed-out trees. Imagine a world where the building itself becomes a living, breathing part of nature. Well, Vatya believes that nature should play a big role in architecture. He loves designing structures that embrace nature's beauty and functionality. From buildings built around trees to facades that regulate temperature, he's all about blending architecture with the natural world. With architects like Patia and the superpowers of AI, the future of cities is going to be amazing. So get ready to step into a world where nature and technology coexist in perfect harmony. It's a dream we can't wait to see come true. Or if you're not a big fan of trees, how about this? Skyscrapers that aren't made of solid bricks, but instead, they're inflatable wonders. Zumo, an architectural practice in Barcelona, used the magic of AI to bring these wobbly structures to life. These inflatable superstructures rise above future cities like illuminated balloons in the sky. Here's the best part. These inflatable buildings have sustainability superpowers. You can pump them up to towering heights, flatten them for easy transportation, and rebuild them wherever they're needed. Plus, they're powered by renewable energy, reducing their impact on the environment. Pretty cool, right? Phew, the future is zooming toward us like a rocket. Artificial intelligence can become the secret sauce that makes architects work extra special. 
But hey, with great power comes great responsibility. We need to use AI wisely and ethically. For now, we don't have to worry about machines replacing architects. Artificial intelligence still needs a human hand, or else we might end up with buildings that look like mashed up bananas or ice cream cones, unless that's your thing. In addition, humans have one important advantage. They, well, are humans. We need to keep in mind that artificial intelligence doesn't have emotional intelligence. It's a brainy genius, but it can't fully understand the feelings and vibes we humans crave in our spaces. So we must remember to infuse our designs with that human touch, those warm and fuzzy elements that make us go, ah, oh, I feel right at home. And let's not forget that AI is still learning. It's basically just taking its first steps, and we need to be patient and give it time to grow. Rushing things too quickly could lead to wonky designs or buildings that look like a jumbled puzzle. This might look cool if you like avant-garde architecture, but for regular folk, no thanks. So, as the future unfolds at warp speed, let's embrace the wonders of AI and architecture. But let's also remember to balance its brilliance with our own human touch. Together, we can create a future where buildings are not just functional, but also filled with heart and soul. It's an adventure that's out of this world. Humanity will once again visit the moon. The mission is planned for 2024. In this crew, we'll see the first women step on the moon. The main goal is to establish a lunar base for continued research that will help NASA prepare for an upcoming mission to Mars. NASA has been planning a crewed flight to the Red Planet set for the 2030s. Robotic rovers did a good job exploring the Martian surface, but astronauts will have to dig deeper to find evidence of water and any fossils proving microscopic life was once possible on our planetary neighbor. New data on Earth-like planets Since its launch in 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope has discovered lots of exoplanets orbiting distant stars. Some of them have an Earth-like mass, composition, and orbits. NASA plans to launch a new generation of telescopes in the 2040s. They'll help us find real twins of our planet and even get pictures of their surfaces. The Return of Halley's Comet It'll be another 41 years before we once again see the most famous comet in the sky. Halley's visits us every 75 years, so some will manage to see it twice in their lifetime. The Longest Solar Eclipse 166 years from now, I'll still be around then, <laughs> the sun will go dark for 7 minutes and 29 seconds. This is pretty close to the predicted maximum. It'll also be the longest eclipse human civilization has ever witnessed in its 10,000 years. Arrival of the Most Notorious Asteroid 1950 DA was once the most probable candidate among near-Earth objects we know to actually strike the planet. Fortunately, the chance was later estimated to be not even a tenth of a percent. It'll most likely pass by on March 16, 2880 mark your calendars, and it'll become a solid evidence that we're safe for a while. The asteroid is more than a mile in diameter, enough to take out life on a planet. A new North Star? The Earth spins like a top. Watch one of these toys closely, and you'll see how its tip starts to draw circles in the air. The Earth's axis, an imaginary line going through the poles, goes full circle once every 26,000 years. It points at different stars along the way, thus changing the North Star. By the year 3000, the Gamma Cephei star will share this title with Polaris as the Earth's axis will point right between them. The first near-Earth supernova Antares is the 15th brightest star in the night skies. It's also an old red supergiant 12 times larger than the Sun. Stars this massive age to a point where they collapse in on themselves, producing huge supernovas. For Antares, this will happen just 10,000 years from now, which is nothing for a 12-million-year-old star. The resulting burst will be too far away to affect life on this planet negatively. But the light show will be visible here on Earth even during the day. Message to the Universe – Delivered Arecibo is the encoded message describing humanity, life on Earth, and the advancement of our scientific knowledge. It was broadcast from the Arecibo radio telescope 
and aimed at the center of the M13 cluster 25,000 light-years away from us. In 25,000 years, it'll finally reach its destination. A new, closest star About 36,000 years from now, the Ross 248 star will become our new closest neighbor. It'll be just 3 light-years away from us and overtake the title from Proxima Centauri, which is a bit more than 4 light-years away. Ross 248 will remain the nearest star for around 9,000 years and then move away once again. So, you didn't like the neighborhood or what? The first interstellar human-made object In 40,000 years, Voyager 1 will reach a point within 1.5 light-years of the Gliese 445 star. It successfully reached interstellar space in 2013. But, unfortunately, it won't be able to power up any of its systems somewhere beyond the year 2025. Voyager 1 has a message, too. A recording of greetings in 55 languages, music from classical to rock and roll, and sounds of the Earth's wildlife. A bare Saturn 100,000 years from now, Saturn will lose its beautiful rings. It'll happen gradually over time as the planet's colossal gravity pulls rocks and ice from this belt floating around it. They'll all eventually fall and get crushed and burned by Saturn's atmosphere. Well, how rude! The ring system is in the middle of its life cycle, so we're incredibly lucky we got to see it in its full glory. The most frightening supernova The WR-104 star will burst into a supernova in 3,000 years. This star is 75,000 light-years away from us, and the blast won't touch us at all. But there is a small chance it'll also produce a gamma-ray burst in the process. If this stream of energy happens to aim right at us, it will negatively affect life on Earth. Good news? Scientists say that's very unlikely. Colliding moons The moons of Uranus are part of a highly unstable system. Some of them have orbits that cross paths. Uranus already has two rings of debris from past collisions of its natural satellites. Desdemona and Cressida will crash into each other in the next million years and produce new rings. A star too close for comfort. The rogue Gliese 710 star is approaching our solar system, and it will get just one light year away in 1.3 million years. This won't have a major impact on the planets, but it could disturb the so-called Oort cloud, which surrounds our solar system and is full of comets. From Earth, the star will look like the brightest planets we see now, and we'll see many more comets in the skies. The closest star to ever go supernova Within a few million years, the Spica star, which is only 240 light-years from us, will burst into a supernova. Supernova are a problem for life when they're three times closer than that, but the supernova itself will shine in the Earth's skies as bright as a full moon. A time capsule for future generations the LAGIOS-1 satellite was launched back in 1976 to gather information about the exact shape of the Earth and tectonic plate movement. But it also contained information about civilization on Earth at the time. It'll re-enter our atmosphere in 8.4 million years. If humanity is around then, they'll learn how life on Earth was in our time. Well, at least how it was some 40 years ago. Rings for Mars Mars' moon, Phobos, orbits really close to the surface, and it continues to get two feet closer every century. 50 million years from now, it'll collide with Mars, resulting in a massive amount of debris going into orbit and forming a ring system around the red planet. Oh, can't wait for that. Days on Earth will get longer. No, really? 1.4 billion years ago, the moon was much closer to our planet. It made the Earth rotate faster, so the day was only 18 hours. The Moon is continuously moving away from Earth. In 180 million years, we'll gain one extra hour. In a little over 2 billion years, a day on Earth will be 36 hours long. No more solar eclipses 600 million years into the future, the Moon will move away from the Earth too far to cover the Sun during eclipses. Those will become ancient relics. The sun will get too bright. 
It'll take about a billion years for the sun to raise its luminosity by 10%. This will be devastating for planets in the solar system, and life on Earth won't be possible beyond this point. By then, our species will likely have found a new planetary home. The sun will swallow the inner planets. In 5 billion years, the sun will begin to evolve into a red giant, growing hundreds of times its current size. It'll swell up so much, it will eventually engulf Mercury, Venus, and possibly Earth. The new Goldilocks habitable zone may shift to the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. This process will take a bit under 3 billion years until the Sun reaches its maximum size. After that, our star will shrink into a white dwarf. The most epic event ever. Around the same time our Sun has swelled up, the nearest neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, will come too close to the Milky Way. If we could watch our galactic neighbor at this time, it'll get larger and larger as it approaches. Then, the two galaxies will start to merge. Bright blue stars will burst into life. New constellations will form. The two spiral galaxies will now be a single giant elliptical one. Wow, I've set an alarm on my smartphone so I don't miss it.